I'm Taylor Riggs in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, Zuckerberg to testify. The Facebook CEO will appear before lawmakers this month on the social network's controversial cryptocurrency. We'll have details. Plus, Whistleblower Speaks, one of the people at the center of the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal, joins me to discuss technology in a voter profiling age, Christopher Wiley on the risks ahead of the 2020 election. And up in smoke, some life insurance policies will soon start classifying vapors as smokers. Prices will rise as a result as the e-cigarette health care continues to pose risks. But first, our top story. Mark Zuckerberg will get a first-hand look at the growing opposition to Facebook's plans to create a cryptocurrency. The CEO will testify before the House Financial Services Committee October 23rd. The hearing will examine Facebook's impact on the financial services and housing industries. For more, I want to bring in Bloomberg Technologies' Kurt Wagner. Uh, Kurt, you know, my first question is how significant that it's Zuckerberg mm -hmm. and not David Marcus going? Yeah, I think it's very significant. Anytime the CEO CEO testifies. I think that's a big deal. But when it's Mark Zuckerberg, it's going to be a huge deal. I was there in April of 2018 when he last testified, and it was a total zoo. It's just everyone wants to see Mark and ask him questions, and I imagine this will be the same. And I know that they had been trying uh, to get Sheryl Sandberg. They were also talking to her. We wrote about that a couple weeks ago. Uh, looks like they got someone even better in theory, which is her boss, Mark Zuckerberg. What do we know about the content of the hearing? Uh, well, we know that this committee focuses on financial services, so Libra, uh, the cryptocurrency Facebook is spearheading, is probably going to be a big portion of this. Uh, they also do housing stuff. You mentioned housing in the intro. Um, Facebook has been accused of uh, issues around its advertising business where um, people are discriminating uh, or being discriminated against, I'm sorry, for housing related issues. And so I imagine that that will come up as well. But the thing about these hearings, as I've learned, is that once you get an executive in front of the committee, pretty much anything goes. Mm -hmm. And so with Mark Zuckerberg in particular being there, I imagine we will hear questions that span the entire gamut. You know, I, I think I've asked you this before and I continue to be perplexed. Did Facebook realize the amount of <laughs> opposition that would be coming their way about cryptocurrency? It's hard to imagine they would have uh, foreseen this level of pushback because if they had, I would hope that they probably would have gone out and done some of this work before announcing the currency. That being said, um, it is a tough chicken and egg situation, which is if they'd gone out and started having all these conversations with politicians and inevitably would have leaked and everyone would have said, well, what's Facebook doing? Do they even have a plan? So they took the other approach. They actually announced the plan and now they're having the conversations and everyone's freaking out about that. So I, I kind of feel like it was a lose-lose for them, but at the same time, you know, did they anticipate that Mark Zuckerberg would be testifying before Congress four months after this was announced? I have a hard time believing that's the case. You mentioned all of the other times that he and other members of Facebook have gone to testify. It's interesting when you look at this share price reaction on those days, Facebook actually rises because you see how those testimonies go and either antitrust isn't as big of a deal as we thought or it looks like regulators maybe don't quite have a bigger understanding of how Facebook works. Do we assume the same? Well, obviously, I, I don't know what the stock's going to do, but what usually happens is these politicians who spend weeks, if not months, just kind of uh, saying really inflammatory things in the press or in press releases, all of a sudden they have to ask real questions to these executives. And oftentimes they either have, they either have a, a real answer, which is not all that exciting. It's like, oh, okay, now we know how that works. Or they avoid the question altogether. Uh, they've gotten really good at not saying things they shouldn't say. And so it doesn't surprise me that people who watch that from a business standpoint usually walk away thinking, well, Facebook survived that. And in fact, you know, Mark Zuckerberg or David Marcus looked good while doing it. Well, we keep our eyes on October 23rd. Bloomberg Technologies, Kurt Wagner, thanks for joining. And time now for our top tech calls. Shares of Roku traded higher Wednesday after analysts at Macquarie upgraded the stock to an outperform. The analyst wrote that while competition is real, the playing field is big and the company occupies a great spot within the sector.
and shares of Netflix closed lower Wednesday after analysts at Rosenblatt Security said there was an unprecedented competition, including from Apple and Walt Disney. They subsequently lowered the price target to 265 from 330 and expect Netflix to miss expectations for subscriber growth in the fourth quarter. And shares of Slack dropped after DA Davidson lowered the price target to 26 from 31 while keeping its neutral rating. Analysts said the company is facing intensifying competition from Microsoft that are slowly gaining market shares. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Prudential says it will tweak its life insurance policy to classify vapors as smokers. The change will mean higher life insurance prices for vapors. This comes amid a nationwide health scare like lung injury cases associated with these cigarettes. For more, I want to bring in Bloomberg's Catherine Chiglinski in New York. Catherine, does this just come, back, come down to tweaking those actuarial assumptions and basically the math that goes in to these life insurance claims? So every insurance company handles it a bit differently and arguably smokers for a long time have had um, a lot higher rates. Um, and so Prudential is changing their policy now to include vapors as smokers. Yeah, I do think it obviously, um, you know, any life insurer wants to sort of analyze how, how long they expect people to live. And, you know, with the health scare, I mean, I think it raises these questions of maybe vaping is similar to smoking. And I think Prudential is taking that into consideration. And is it smart that Prudential here seems to be reactive, waiting until a lot of the health studies came out, until federal agencies were really highlighting the concerns about vaping versus being reactive and doing this a few months ago? Well, I think that's an interesting point. So you don't see um, life insurance companies in particular um, be very reactive, um, like very quickly reactive. So I think the fact that Prudential is sort of taking it into consideration, looking at sort of what um, regulators are saying um, is definitely interesting. I know each, you know, it's my understanding that um, every life insurance company treats it a little differently. Um, some might classify it as smoking. Um, so it is interesting that Prudential is saying, you know, we've looked at our policy and given all the information, we're going to change ours. And Catherine, do you just assume that Prudential is the first of many to now reenact this policy? So I, th I think some have already, you know, treated um, vapors as smokers. So I'm not sure if it'll be a huge tidal wave that we see, but I think it at least shows that um, big companies are looking at the policies they have and could uh, potentially change it. Thank you to Bloomberg's Catherine Chiglinski. Now, public safety is the reason behind PG&E's unprecedented decision to cut power to a half million customers in wide swaths of Northern California. The move is to prevent wildfires and protect the public. Never before have California utilities intentionally cut power to so many people. Electricity will be out in cities including Oakland and Berkeley, but San Francisco and Silicon Valley are excluded. With more, it's analyst James Sprintz from Bloomberg NEF in New York. So, James, this is seen as a good thing, right, as sort of these preventative measures that PG&E is taking? Well, good, I guess, depends on your perspective. It's certainly good that it has the potential to limit the wildfires and certainly cause less death. But if you're a customer who's lost power potentially for a week, some might say, um, I don't think you're viewing it as a particularly good thing at the moment. What are some of the other solutions for PG&E? Is it do these preventative blackouts? Are there other technological upgrades? What do they do in this situation? Well, there's, the first thing says there's no easy or cheap solution to this problem. Um, there's a range of things they can do, and they'll probably have to do some of all of them. So one is that they could start undergrounding parts of their transmission system. That would be very expensive and take a long time to do. They could start offering subsidies to customers to deploy backup power systems, storage, for example. That's something they are already doing, but you know, only about 10,000 Californians have batteries in their homes, so you need significantly more. They could start developing microgrids in certain communities, you know, shutting off power almost permanently, helping them develop uh, microgrids. Whether that's something they would want to do is very unclear. Or they could develop utility-scale batteries in strategic locations. Um, 
you know, if they know they're going to cut out power and charge those in advance. So there's a range of things. The problem is those are all expensive options and will take time to, to implement. You know, James, at the beginning of our conversation, you said it's good depending on your perspective. I wonder who, if anyone, benefits from this? So you couldn't really come up with a better marketing campaign um, for buying a backup battery or a generator. So the companies selling those, um, for example, Tesla, Sunrun selling solar and storage, companies like Generac selling um, you know, backup power systems and generators, they, I imagine, are pretty happy with the situation because this is a major opportunity for them to sell more systems to customers, and I would expect to see quite a significant boost in their Q4 sales. We've already heard news that, you know, in places like Home Depot, they're running out of um, backup generators, so clearly customers are responding to this and trying to prepare themselves for these events, whether they're people who are directly affected by the blackouts or they've just read about it in the news and preemptively want to, to buy a system to be prepared. So you mentioned Tesla. Um, how do electric vehicles or EV uh, benefit from this? Well, I think you know EVs, like other sources of demand, are no different. If there's a blackout, that affects them. Obviously, if you're planning on going on a long journey and your car is not charged, that's a major problem. But one interesting area is there's a couple of companies pushing the idea of what's called vehicle to home or vehicle to grid. Essentially, the idea of using the battery in your car as a power source and you know to power your home or sell energy back to the grid that's quite niche but actually with events like this becoming more common it may give a lot more interest in that and we may start to see that become more of a phenomenon any sense of what tech companies in the region may be affected by this well, at the moment, we've kind of seen, you know, a lot of the blackouts have been occurring in, in more rural communities, but there have also been some in, in Silicon in Valley as well. So I imagine kind of a lot of companies really across the entire California um, economy are going to be re really feeling the pinch for these blackouts. My thank you to James Sprintz. He's an analyst with Bloomberg NEF. And coming up behind Tesla's big bet on its autopilot feature, do customers benefit from the technology or does the company have a long road ahead to full autonomy? And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. there is increasing scrutiny on unprofitable private companies. On Wednesday, I spoke with one of them, Cohesity CEO Mohit Aaron, and an investor, Carl Eschenbach of Sequoia Capital. I asked them about quality top-line growth at the expense of profits and the competitive software space. Take a listen. Cohesity is uh, redefining data management. Uh, we have uh, big customers. We have customers like the U.S. Air Force, Northern Trust. Uh, in Europe, we have Orsted. Uh, we did our first 10 plus million dollar deal. We grew our one plus million dollar deals by more than 350 percent. So we are doing immensely well. Uh, the problem that we're trying to solve is uh, that uh, data is very siloed today in any enterprise. Uh, and what Cohesity does, it brings together that data on one platform that spans the data center and the cloud. So basically a customer's multi-cloud environment. And then we expose the goodness of that platform through apps and services. Backups just happens to be the first one. Uh, but the losers and winners of tomorrow will be decided uh, by how much value they can extract out of that enterprise data. And that's what's driving all this great adoption. And we are very excited to uh, be doing what we're doing. And Carl, when you take a look at Cohesity over the last year, what's the biggest change you've seen in the company? Well, what we've seen is what uh, Mohit just articulated and what they announced uh, earlier today in their most recent, you know, uh, performance metrics around their press release that they're seeing massive adoption from large enterprise scale customers. I mean, it's, it's really unusual to see a company that's actually been in the market for only about three years and seeing them having a $10 million software transaction that means that the large enterprises are embracing this whole solution of data management and how Mohit and the team of Cohesity are refining data management and deploying it at scale. 
Uh, that's highly unusual for a company of this stage, and it's not one customer, it's many customers. As he indicated, we've seen 350% growth in million dollar plus transactions, and that's software transactions. And it's with the Fortune, you know, 100s of the world who are deploying this. So that's been a radical change in the last year. And one uh, change that we've also accomplished in the last year is our shift to uh, software defined stuff. Uh, our revenues now are completely in software. Uh, we no longer book hardware on our books. That gives a lot of flexibility to our customers. They no longer uh, worry about just buying one piece of hardware. They, can, they now have a choice of so many different platforms that we qualify. And we have become a software company. Uh, I think our investors like Sequoia are thrilled about that. Yeah, and the other well, thing, Taylor, that's, sorry, the other thing I was gonna add that's really impressive is the ecosystem in which that, you know, Cohesity is building around them. If you look at the three largest cloud providers, Google, uh, Amazon, and Microsoft, they have deep partnerships with them, as well as a lot of the infrastructure companies in the data centers like HPE, like Cisco, like VMware, you know, they've done an amazing job building a robust ecosystem around the Cohesity platform for both on-premise and, you know, uh, public cloud offerings. And, and you don't see that this fast happening at a, a company of this stage. Well, and Carl, as you take a look at Cohesity and some of the other companies as well that you're involved in, what's the pressure in the last six months to be more involved, perhaps on a daily basis, to make sure you're curbing excess spending, to make sure that growth at any cost doesn't happen under your watch? Yeah, so, you know, as Sequoia, we pride ourselves on being business partners with, with all the companies that, that we invest in. Um, and we're making sure that they're growing because growth is a key uh, you know, metric that everyone looks at, but we also want to make sure why we're growing, we're doing it. It's not always profitable day one, but we have a path towards profitability. And if you look at Moed, this is such a big market opportunity Cohesity has. And you see our hyperscale growth in some of the numbers we just spoke about, uh, but we also are trying to do it to, in a way that we're, you know, mining our expenses to make sure that we're just not doing it at any cost because at some point people do look at profitability of even startups and that while they may not be profitable today, there is a path towards profitability and that's what we see here at Cohesity. We love the explosive growth. Yeah, we spend a little money to do it, but ultimately we have a path towards profitability and, and that's really what we're focused on as partners uh, when it comes to investors with our companies like Cohesity. And I would add that and we are very fiscally responsible. Uh, we have a clear path to profitability, and eventually it's all about unit economics. Our unit economics are great, um, and when your unit economics are great, you want to invest more on the growth side because you know that eventually that's going to all uh, move towards profitability. That was Mohit Aaron of Cohesity and Sequoia Capital partner Kyle Eschenbach. Now, Tesla aims to dominate the global auto market by building the world's first self-driving car, and it considers autopilot to be the first crucial step. Customers adore it. They've logged more than one and a half billion miles on autopilot, often pushing the limits of the software. However, the technology still has a ways to go, considering there have been a number of casualties while using the feature. In this week's edition of Bloomberg Business Week, Zachary Miter writes about Tesla's autopilot, and he joins me now. Zach, first, what was it like to ride in a Tesla on autopilot? Nerve-wracking or exhilarating? It's, uh, the word I would use is maybe creepy, in the sense that uh, it just feels kind of weird to have the car turning the wheel, accelerating, uh, with no input from you at all. And it, it's very human-like, but that can be deceptive because it's, it really does require supervision. So Zachary, you hint on the tension, which is it's a great technology, but casualties are also coming. Is that the internal tension that Tesla's facing right now? So Tesla's strategy in terms of getting to an autonomous vehicle is really different from the other players in the space. Uh, people like uh, the Google spin-off Waymo or General Motors are being very, very cautious and careful and trying to kind of get to a fully autonomous functional vehicle before they kind of release it broadly to the public. And Tesla is basically taking their, um, their kind of semi-autonomous product and, and trying to put it on the road as fast as they can, sell it to as many people as they can. And so with that strategy comes risk, right? I mean, people are gonna be out there misusing it 
and in some cases dying. Uh, but Tesla actually believes that they can get to full autonomy quicker that way by having this kind of fleet of cars uh, that are, you know, that, that have the technology installed. Where is the regulation around this? So to regulators, autopilot right now today is simply an advanced driver assistance feature. So it's, it's basically like cruise control. So as long as the humans are supposed to be supervising it all the time, regulators aren't really, uh, they, it doesn't have to pass any special regulatory hurdles. Obviously full autonomy is gonna be a big regulatory hurdle in most US states because you have to have a, a license to drive a car. And so how do you give a computer that license? That's very tricky. So Tesla has a way kind of to get something quasi-autonomous, semi-autonomous on the road now without having to meet that regulatory hurdle. Except that Tesla has said that they want full autonomy, I think by 2020, right? I mean, then what? Right, so Elon Musk has said that this year, uh, autopilot will be feature complete. In other words, you can, you can turn it on on any kind of road condition, any kind of road. And then by next year, he expects it to be so good that you won't have to supervise it anymore. And that is an incredibly ambitious bold uh, timeline considering that, you know, Waymo's been working on this for 10 years. They're not anywhere close to having a, a fully autonomous car and they're not, they're not making promises about being able to do it in a few more months. Well, and Zachary, we know that Elon Musk does make pretty bold, grand predictions and visions. Why does he think that he will beat out the competition that you just mentioned? So the theory at Tesla is that the this huge install base, this 500,000, 600,000 cars on the road with autopilot, uh, essentially give them the competitive advantage that they can take data, they can actually use all those cars to train their algorithm to get smarter. And that the, the data advantage will actually allow them to get to autonomy quicker. Well, creepy is the word that I'll take away from that interview. Thank you, that was Bloomberg Zachary Miter. Thanks for joining me. And coming up, whistleblower is the word du jour in Washington. But before Ukraine, there was Cambridge Analytica. We talked to Christopher Wiley on why he spilled the secrets of the data mining company. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Technology, I'm Taylor Riggs in San Francisco. Facebook is appealing a ruling that says its users can sue the social network over the Cambridge Analytica data scandal. Facebook says the court's decision does not line up with other verdicts by other courts, including the U.S. Supreme Court. The plaintiffs are arguing that Facebook improperly shared their data with third parties without their permission. More than 80 million user accounts were involved in that scandal. Now, who better to talk about Cambridge Analytica than the man who blew the whistle on the company? It is Christopher White. He is also the author of a new book that details the whole series of events. He joins me from New York and also with me, Bloomberg Business Week columnist Max Chafkin. Christopher, great to have you. I mean, you were involved so much in this data scandal, and I just wonder as you sit here and reflect, what has your experience been like? Um, well, it's it's been intense. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Um, you know, I, I writing a book actually helped me really reflect on everything that happened. Um, you know, I talk about my journey from getting recruited at a military contractor to, you know, working on um, modeling and data work that that I helps identify people who are more prone to um, uh, paranoid ideation and extremism with the idea of trying to mitigate that problem, to having that work completely inverted after you know, uh, an alt-right billionaire and Steve Bannon acquired our company, uh, to in effect do the same thing in America, targeting um, you know, people who are more prone to radicalization, but in this case for the alt-right. 
You know, Chris, for coming forward uh, the way you did, blowing the whistle on Facebook, which, as we said on this program many times, it's an incredibly powerful media company, maybe maybe the most powerful media company in, in history. Yeah. Um, what was that like? I mean, have you did you get any pushback from Facebook, any threats? And, and as you've sort of moved to publish the book and, and tell the story in full, have you heard from them at all? Oh, girl, where do I begin? Um, like, when before the story even emerged, I'd been working with law enforcement and regulatory agencies for you know months and months and months before the actual story broke. Um, you know, when Facebook uh, found out that um, you know this story was emerging, something that they you know they knew about Cambridge Analytica, you know, well before any of this was published. Um, you know, the first thing that they do is threaten the journalists of the Guardian um, with, in my view, a spurious uh, libel accusation. It turned it turned out that everything was true, um, and I in my case, they went and banned me. Uh, they banned me off of Facebook, and they also banned me for some reason off of Instagram. Um, you know, and then after that point, working you know uh, you know day in and day out with regulatory authorities in the EU, in the UK, in the United States, all over the world. You know, one of the things that I, I really saw is just like the power that this company has to, you know, uh, to hide, to obfuscate their work, uh, and and things that you know. I, one of the things that I, I came to sort of understand is that, you know, when you when you go and you you blow the whistle, you see something that's that's wrong, and you and you report that to an authority. You think that there's going to be like some guy somewhere in some federal agency building that like knows what to do. And one of the things that I realized is that uh, you know there there isn't that guy. That guy doesn't exist. Um, you know I've talked to governments, I've talked to regulators, I've talked to Congress, I've talked to parliaments. People do not know how to handle this problem. And you know f for me the the real concern is that we have a completely unregulated um, digital landscape that you know companies like Facebook take advantage of. And even though companies like Cambridge Analytica now have dissolved and no longer exist, the capabilities are still there. And one of the th reasons why I wrote the book was so that, you know, to serve as a warning, because even if this company no longer exists, what happens if China becomes the next Cambridge Analytica? What happens if North Korea becomes the next Cambridge Analytica? A and currently, there are no rules. We are entrusting our democratic process to a private company. And I question whether that's a good idea. Well, Christopher, you mentioned uh, that you're in conversations with lawmakers and other regulators, and I wonder if you think that the current regulation and current lawmakers are doing a good enough job handling the problem, as you describe. Well, I think that you know one of the one of the things going to Congress I realized was the power of lobbyists, um, uh, particularly the power of lobbyists to define narratives. You know, one of the first questions um, that I would always get at Congress. Uh, is you know can the law ever keep up with technology? And you know I would say, well, we regulate nuclear power plants, we regulate airplanes, we regulate you know medicine safety standards. There's all kinds of technologies that we regulate in the name of consumer safety. Just because something uses software or is you know on the internet doesn't mean that we can't create rules that require companies to consider you know whether the products that they're Putting out into the public will be safe for people to use. Um, you know, the United States is one of the only OECD countries. I think the only OECD country that doesn't have a national level privacy law. Um, and you know, I, I when you look at you know the, the 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 language and the way that a lot of Silicon Valley companies you know talk about themselves, they they say we're a service. There's opt in. There's terms and conditions. All this stuff. Yet, when you look at the types of people who work at the company, right? They're called an engineer. They're called an architect, right? What you know? They build ecosystems and environments. These are things that people are going into. These are architectures. And when you look at how we regulate physical architecture or engineering, right? Where if you built a building, if you were an architect and you built a building without fire exits, and you said, well, it's okay because like people agreed they opted into my building, they walked in and there was like a book of terms and conditions over there. And you know, if it burns down, well, that was their choice. We, we, the, the, people wouldn't stand for that. And I'm, so I, I think that one of the things that I hope people, particularly lawmakers, if they read the book, the, you know, one of the takeaways is we need to really understand what is social media. What are these platforms? And they're architectures, and they need they need safety standards.
So, you know, we've got obviously 2020 elections coming up. The the data that was at issue, um, you know, with the, the Cambridge Analytica scandal that, that we've been talking about for years, is that data still around? And, and do we, like, is it possible or conceivable that, that it could actually come into play again, you know, four years later? And I guess in a larger sense, like, how worried should we be about foreign interference, you know, going forward? Um, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know what happens with that information. I don't know what happened with that data. Um, a lot of the same people who were working at Cambridge Analytica now work on the Trump campaign. Um, you know, th this is a, a company that had regular contact with Russian officials. You know, the, the CEO like shared vodka with the Russian ambassador. You, you had its, uh, its clients, you know, regularly meeting with the Russian ambassador during 2016 and also then going and meeting with the Trump campaign. So I, 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 I there, the people exist, the capabilities exist. Whether or not the data still exists, I don't know. Um, you know, Facebook presumably has tried to contain the, the problem. You know, when I dealt with them, they didn't really do much. Um, but that, that's, that's exactly why I think we do need to take a step back and go, should there be some kind of, you know, consumer safety watchdog when it comes to digital platforms? Because if no one's watching, you know, these, these are the things that can happen. And, and, and in this case, you know, we had people come forward and talk to the media, but what, are, what about the cases where that doesn't happen? Christopher, I think we've talked a lot about the 2016 election, and I wonder, is it inevitable that this begins again with 2020? Yeah, I think we are sort of, this is a new norm. Um, you know, one of the things that I talk about in the book is, you know, how does information warfare work, particularly online? Um, and this is, you know, a new, we, we, we've, we've created an open door to the minds of every single voter in the United States. And currently, like, we are trusting a company uh, to protect people from hostile foreign interference. But, you know, just, we, we talk a lot about Russia, but my real concern is, what about all the other countries that have now watched what you're able to do, right? China, North Korea, Iran, you name it. These are all countries that have, you know, very strategic motives to interfere in the election. And currently, like, no one's protecting it, right? We, we are literally entrusting Mark Zuckerberg to do the right thing. The, the, the candidate who's, I think, closest to where you're talking is Elizabeth Warren. Uh, you know, she's talked uh, a lot about regulating or even breaking up mm. Facebook. Have you talked, been in touch with anyone at the Warren campaign or, or any of the other uh, presidential campaigns in terms of advising them on, on, on policy? Um, no, I haven't, but I'm definitely open to chatting with people. I, I, I you know, any opportunity, I'll talk to people who are in, you know, decision making, uh, you know, uh, positions. But I, I think, that, you know, it's, it's great. What Elizabeth Warren is doing, I think, is great because, um, you know, whether you love her or hate her, she is mainstreaming a conversation that really we all need to have. Whether you're a Democrat or Republican, we need to talk about, you know, the impact of the Internet on, on our political process. And this is something that everybody is a stakeholder in. Um, and, you know, one of the points that she makes is, like, we are literally relegating the role of referee uh, to a private company, you know, just today they're saying, you know, we're not going to take down, uh, you know, f provably false information if it's political advertising, you know, and it's, and it's like, sh why, why does a company get to decide that? It's so something so vital and so important for, you know, how an election runs. So I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm heartened that she is, you know, talking about it. Um, other, you know, other people are talking about it also. You know, Andrew Yang, for example. Um, right. You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy that that's part of a conversation. And we are pushing forward there to the 2020 election. So it's Christopher Wiley, the man who blew the lid off the Cambridge Analytica, and Bloomberg's Max Chapkin. Thank you both for joining. And coming up, wiring the world. That was the promise that Quintillion CEO Elizabeth Pierce promised her investors. One problem, though, she's now in jail. We look into what went down next. This is Bloomberg. In the latest episode of Bloomberg Studio 1.0, Emily Chang sits down for an exclusive interview with Astro Teller, captain of Moonshots and head of Alphabet's X Lab in Mountain View, California. They discuss some of the biggest projects to come out of the X Lab, including Google Glass, Waymo, and Project Loon. Take a listen. It was certainly an experiment. There were aspects of it that were absolutely a failure. I, I want to be 
fair to Glass, having learned a lot of lessons, some of them maybe more painfully than we needed to, Glass is still very much an ongoing business and quite successful. It's just not much in the public eye. That's right. So Glass is back, or Glass never left. Glass went away. never left. Glass, it turns out, the right place for this for right now in society are the parts of society that are less fashion conscious and that have real practical needs. So these are doctors and nurses, people who work in manufacturing environments, who work on oil rigs, who are maintaining airplanes. The irony is this is one of the technologies from Silicon Valley that the Digerati said no thank you to. Mm -hmm. But actually the heartland of America is super happy to have because of the productivity enhancements that it gets. Do you think so, glass will ever be back in like this form? Well, I think it will by the glasses, time. Glasses, AR glasses. Yes, as glasses, they will absolutely be when? back. I don't know, three to six years. Hmm. It will depend on the technology, it will depend on social readiness. It's when we pretend that it's done when it's not done. Mm -hmm. And so X has worked even harder afterwards to be clear with each thing like Waymo or Loon or Wings, we get out into the world. We're not putting it anywhere that it's not safe, but we're not pretending that we're more done than we're done because we don't want to recreate that glass failure mode. So as much as you want things to succeed, you have actually created a sort of culture of failure here or a culture where right. it is okay to fail in the hopes that you will right. succeed. Tell me about that. So the secret is I hate failing, <laughs> but I want to win in the long run. I want us to win in the long run. We have to create a culture. If we want you to be honest, if we want you to fearlessly run the right experiments and then be honest about the outcomes that says we embrace the quality of the experiment, not the outcome. But what are some of the epic failures? Like I'd, I'd love to hear how this has worked in practice. So we built a system that could turn seawater into methanol using clean energy. That's real save the world kind of stuff. And we got it working. And it turned out that the cheapest we believed we could get it was a $15 gallon of gas equivalent. Mm. And this was one of these honesty moments where we said, we want to save the world. We're incredibly proud we built this machine. Mm. But if the cheapest we're going to get this anytime soon is $15 gallon of gas equivalent, that's not gonna save the world. No one's gonna buy that. Mm. We published the business failure with Fast Company and we published the science learnings that we had in the International Journal of Greenhouse Gas Control and said, here's what we learned. Can anyone build on this? So let's talk about the projects that you're working on that have potential, like real potential. One of the ones that I think has a lot of potential, the self-driving car business. Of course, is... well, we got to talk about Waymo. I mean, Waymo is people would think of as probably the biggest success of X so far. I think Waymo is in a great position. Waymo has helped everyone around the world get serious about this particular space. Waymo has done a great job in making these cars drive safely. Mm -hmm. uh, Waymo is already now charging people as a transportation as a service in Arizona. So that's going exceptionally well, and, and we're really proud of Waymo. And Waymo has spun out of X. It's yeah. a unit under Alphabet. You've got Morgan Stanley saying it's worth $175 billion. However, there are skeptics who say, when am I going to see this self-driving car? It's taking too long. Who's right? Well, these things are going to take time. So you can see one of those if you just walk outside our building, if you go to Arizona. So there are now many hundreds of cars on the road. But when does it hit the mainstream? For regulatory reasons, it's gonna take a while. And look, the world has already paid for a lot of cars. So as those cars are retired, that's one of the things that will sort of pull self-driving cars into the mainstream. And then of course there's Loon. Loon is doing very well. There was actually just recently a um, emergency in Peru and we got to jump in and help connect a lot of people who would lost internet there. And that's the third time we've done that. These are the internet beaming balloons. Exactly. So that one is making good progress. Like each of these things, it's a long process, but 
we have increasing faith that uh, Loon is actually the right way to bring connectivity to several billion people in the world who don't have it today. Where are you focusing current project? Is, is, it, is it energy? Is it healthcare? Is it automation, farming, agriculture? Yes, all of those. <laughs> um, we have, I think, every single thing you just named, we have at least one exploration in but there's some that I'm feeling particularly good about right now. So agriculture as an example, you know, the humanity's ability to produce enough food to feed everyone in the world and to do that in a sustainable way, we're topping out and it's pretty scary. We now have several things here at X that are looking at food production from several different avenues and we're excited mm. about the, those things so i feel really good about that um healthcare what about healthcare sure here's an example you know this is an early thing that we're exploring but there are spaces in which the innovation went like this because there was a simulator for the thing people are innovating on if you could go into cell biology, for example. If you could simulate how a cell works, then you could run experiments at thousands, maybe even millions of times the rate that humans can run those experiments in the lab, and that would cause an enormous explosion in the innovation in the life sciences. Hmm. Now, being able to simulate a cell accurately in a computer who knows if we can do that, but that's an example where we have some interesting progress. That was Astro Teller, the captain of Moonshots Alphabet's X Lab, speaking exclusively with Bloomberg's Emily Chang. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology. And be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.